We're in your hands. Hello, good afternoon. We're talking about female monasticism in the Orthodox Church and whether it's a feminist role model or not. You will have seen, if you looked at my handout, that monastic communities, female monastic communities, especially, began to form in the third and fourth centuries around the areas of, of the Holy Land, in the deserts of Syria and so on and so forth. It has now, as you'll see from this map though, expanded all over the world. And I know for a fact that there's a monastery in every country indicated, a female monastery. <coughs> every convent or monastery, because they use the word of, um, you know, quite interchangeably, operate throughout the world in exactly the same way. And what you're going to see in this video is echoed throughout the world. It's just language that really indicates where you might be. Tämä on sillä tavalla, että hyvä paikka, että on hyvä ilmapiiri. Tämä on hyvin hengellinen luostari. Näiden molempien vientilostarien merkitys tietysti on tällä tavalla. Ne ovat hengellisen elämänkeskuksia. Ne ovat niitä kaikille täälläkin sen erityisen hyvin myöskin aistii ja tunteena. No nykyaikana me yleensä kehotamme ensin pyrkimään talkoolaisiksi. Ja sillä tavalla sitten, että me pyrkiä tutustumme meihin ja me tutustumme tähän talkoolaiseen. Ja sitten voi jo etukäteen katsoa, että onko mahdollisuuksia. Ja sen jälkeen, jos hän haluaa jäädä, niin sitten otamme kuuliaisuus sisäreikseen. Sitten hän siitä tulee sitten virallinen kuuliaisuus sisään, jolloin hän saa jo vähän niin kuin ongelmaisia vaatteita, mutta ei ole pysty millä tavalla virallisesti vielä opettu. Mutta sitten kun on vihitään viitan kantajaksi, joskus sitä kutsutaan puolin onnaksi, niin silloin hän saa jo tämän onnan asun ja hänet otetaan niin kuin luostarin kirjoihin. Hän on luostarin luostari seurakunnan jäsen. Ja siitä sitten vielä useampi vuosi ennen kuin vihitään onnaksi. Tässä on hyvin pitkä siis tämä prosessi. Ja siinä pitää, pitää miettiä sitten tarkkaan ennen kuin se iskiytymään onnaksi, että onko valmis. Ja voi katsoa koko luostari, että hän ei mennä, että voi vähän riskiä. Yleensä luostarissa kirkko on niin se luostarin elämän keskus. Ja joka kerta kun liturgia, niin sehän on hyvin tärkeä erikoinen suunnassa tuottava palvelus, jossa tosiaankin rukoillaan sitten koko maailmankin puolesta ja mitä tämä on tämä meidän elämämme täällä, että se on niin pyrkimistä kohti Jumalan parempaan tuntemisen ja lähdösyyteen. So, how do nuns see themselves? Well, they dress all in black. And it's not like other religions where they're hiding away uh, behind their long black clothes. It is a symbol of having moved from the, the secular world into an entirely different world. And they dress exactly the same as male monks. And as they say, uh, their services are the same, and it's entirely beyond gender as in Christ there is no male or female, as you mentioned earlier, Mark. For a woman who is self-reliant and independent, there is space here for her spiritual growth. Now, one doesn't often think of nuns as being self-reliant and independent. One perhaps thinks of them as being little women, but nothing could be further from the truth. What is the life and work of a nun? Well, she leaves the world and joins the monastery, 
to a life of chastity, hard work, and obedience to the abbess, who is her spiritual mother. Prayer and work is the whole of the nun's life. They are praying for salvation and peace for the world, and they go about their work day with the Jesus prayer constantly on their lips and in their hearts. The practical work would be to keep the monastery, like any domestic arrangement, afloat, making beds, cooking, gardening, cleaning, doing all those sorts of jobs. Prayer happens in two chunks, a big chunk at the beginning and at the end of the day, unlike <coughs> the Western tradition that has sort of seven uh, sections of, of prayer through the day. They offer spiritual direction to guests, should they want it. They offer hospitality to pilgrims, and also to keep the um, monastery in finances, they'll make vestments or candles or incense or any number of different things. So it's a, it's a lot of hard work, and I've not seen a nun sit down for five minutes together, except to eat a meal. When I spoke to Mother Sarah of Bath, as my uh, field work, she said to me that becoming a monastic is for each person a very personal matter. And uh, her answer was, I expect they would all say they wanted to focus their lives on prayer, and that they wanted to serve God in a specific, dedicated way, and that they felt it was God's will for them, which I think was echoed by the video that we watched. I'm now going to concentrate on two specific sorts of nuns that we've seen in the past, and I dare say we will hear of in the future. Wars and political turmoil don't just upset the ordinary community, they upset everybody. And these ladies became nuns, very much like the ones you've just watched in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And then during the rise of communist Russia, as you can see here, monasteries were destroyed and the nuns were persecuted. They were crucified. They were given communion with melted lead. They, you know, the lucky ones were sent off to the concentration camps in Siberia, which were very like the World War II camps, only a dance site colder. Some of them survived, and they came out, and it was still a communist state, and they still could not practice their religion or form monasteries. So they moved back often to the villages where they'd come from, into things like converted bathhouses that were in effect hovels, really. And they lived the lives of ordinary old women, dressed as old women, going about their business as old women. But within the four walls of their homes, they continued to live the consecrated monastic life to which they had um, been tonsured in their early years, and had continued through the time in the concentration camps to practice as much as they could. Archivand Wright Tikon, who wrote Everyday Saints and Other Stories, met some of these elderly women who were now in their 80s to over 100 years old, some of them, um, in one of these places. And this is what he says of them. These old women were, in fact, some of the most courageous modern-day confessors of our faith, true heroines who had suffered tortures and decades in prisons and concentration camps for their beliefs. And yet, despite all their ordeals, their spiritual loyalty and unshakable faith in God had only grown. And then we're going to look at another very remarkable woman. She was born in Russia of no noble family. Her name in the world was Elizabeth. She was part of the Russian intelligentsia. She was a poet. She was a politician. She was deputy mayor of her city. She'd lost her faith. She had various marriages, love affairs, children, the works. It was when one of her children died as a youngster that she returned to God, and then because it was a communist country, she decided to move from Russia to Paris and join the emigres, of which there was a huge community living there, who were living in great poverty. Most of them didn't know where their next meal was coming from. They were working in factories and all sorts. In fact, she went to a factory and offered lectures in Dostoevsky, and that's what they said to them. We don't need Dostoevsky. We need someone to clean and to sew and to sort, basically sort our lives out. So she said, right, forget Dostoevsky. And she stayed for several days and devoted herself to cleaning their rooms, sewing, mending their clothes, ironing, and so on. That's the sort of woman she was. 
When her second marriage failed in Paris, the bishop suggested that she become a nun. She said that she would only become a nun on one condition, that she wouldn't be shoved in a monastery, but that she should continue to work amongst the people who needed her. So he said, yes, okay, that's unusual, but we'll do that. So in 1932, at the age of 40, she became a nun. She rented this house, uh, number 77, Rue de Romaine, and there she fed and housed a hundred refuge, Russian refugees every day. She would go out to the markets and get out-of-date vegetables, and she would beg leftover fish and bones and anything that she could get together that she could make meals out of to feed these people and any others that, that came away. She smoked, out of interest. She's also been known to be sat behind a glass of beer in her day, in her full nun's regalia. Uh, so she was most unusual. She said that in heaven, we're not going to be asked how many prayers we've said, but we are going to be asked, did we feed the hungry and did we clothe the poor? And that is what she worked on. Then came the persecution of the Jews because the Nazis arrived in Paris. And uh, she and the priest who served the hospitable house did everything they could and rescued hundreds of Jews by giving them baptismal certificates so that they could say that they were converted and generally looking after them. Then came the great arrest of Jews and they were put into a sports stadium over 6,000 of them, one standpipe of water, very little food, two-thirds of them were children. They were all headed for Auschwitz. She worked there for three days, feeding them, seeing to the children. She made an arrangement with the bin men to bring empty bins so they could smuggle children out. Truly remarkable woman. She was arrested along with the priest, her son, and others who'd been helping the Jews. They were all sent to concentration camps. And on the 31st of March, 1945, she went into the gas chambers. She actually uh, was canonized a saint in 2004. So, to conclude, far from being little women, Orthodox nuns of feminist role models of the first water, I would say. They come in all shapes and sizes, from all backgrounds, as they historically always have, from career women, educated and successful to the highest level, wives, mothers, factory workers, any age and station, nobility and commoners. These women are strong in body, mind and spirit. They are full of life and vitality. They possess enormous strength of character and courage in the face of whatever comes their way, and they have given up everything because they share a love of God and a will to serve God and the world. Any questions? Let's clap you first. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, questions, anybody? Silence. Oh, okay. It's golden. Fair enough. <laughs>